you're in for a special treat this weekend. We have a guest speaker, Mike Breen, and his wife Sally is here as well. And uh, they're all the way from Pauley's Island, South Carolina. And Mike and Sally are well known to our staff and to many people here at Woodside. They started out in England, born there, and God called them to work in a church. And through their work in that church and through uh, discipleship and missional communities, that church soon, soon became the largest church in England. And then back in 2007, uh, God called them to work under Leadership Network to start a church planting movement across Europe. And during those next four years, 1,137 churches were started in a, in a part of the world where uh, it's very, very hard work. Uh, in the last few years at Pauley's Island, they have led a discipleship and leadership network, uh, leadership development uh, program that goes across the country, really across the world. We're delighted that they're here this weekend uh, to be with us and to challenge us. Uh, they were here for the last two days, Friday night and up until just before the service started, doing a, a workshop on family on mission. And so enjoy them, take notes, and uh, be inspired. Uh, would you join me, please, in, in welcoming Mike and Sally Breen? Thank you, Doug. God bless you, Mike. It's great God to be here, brother. You. Thank you. Sally's going to come up and join me um, in a moment. She, she's not really that bothered about sitting there looking adoringly at my behind um, through the whole of the sermon. We are a remarkable people. We are people with a mission. Very few people on the planet really have a purpose to life. Very few people have a compass bearing that orientates them in a direction that can cause them to be able to go from day to day knowing what it is that they're born for. The words of Jesus are very clear. These are his last words. I come from a military background. My dad was really man and boy in the British Army. All of my family were in the British Army. I was the only one who wasn't, but I was potty trained at gunpoint. So I know, I know what it's like to be raised in a military home. And if your commanding officer says whatever he wants to you, you do the last thing that he said. It's very clear. Jesus had one opportunity to give us the last word before he ascended into heaven. And you know the words, but I'm going to read them to you one more time. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. There it is. There's the mission. The mission is to make disciples. The mission is to reproduce ourselves in the lives of others. The mission is to multiply disciples in the world while we have the opportunity. But so often, we find ourselves distracted. So often, we find ourselves away from the very center and heart of what it is that Jesus gave us to do. I had an illustration of this uh, when Sally and I were preparing to follow the call to come to the United States. The Lord gave us this call, this Abrahamic call of go, and I'll show you. It was an unusual thing for us to be leaving such a successful church behind. We had raised up the next generation of leaders. We were in our mid-40s. We really didn't expect to get this call, but the Lord made it very clear that that's what He was doing. He was sending us here as missionaries here. I mean, do you need missionaries in America? I don't know, but that's what the Lord said. And He sent us off with this Abrahamic call. He said, go and I'll show you what to do. The funny thing is, is that one of the main things we did is to go back to Europe with Leadership Network and plant churches, but we probably would never have done that if we'd never have come. But before we left, we, we thought, you know, everybody in America is so kind of fit and healthy, we've seen them on TV, so what we need to do is we need to join a gym 
because otherwise we're, you know, we're, we're going to kind of look foolish when we get there. And so, so we, um, we, we got in a gym and they, they kind of gave us the conducted tour. It looked to me like a torture chamber. I wasn't quite sure what they were trying to sell because all of these machines, I, I, I mean, I just saw these people in pain on them. And, 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 um, and then uh, near, the, near the, the torture chamber, there was this other place where you could kind of chill out afterwards. And it was a pool, and there was a hot tub, and there were various other things. And I thought, man, that's awesome. And so, you know, we, we did a bit of the stuff in the, in the gym, and then we'd go down to the pool and sit in the hot tub. And, you know, the time in the gym got a little less, and the time in the pool got a little more. And, and then sometimes we thought we'd just go to the hot tub, and we'd kind of get it by osmosis. I mean, we're in the right atmosphere, and uh, probably we'd just be fit by just being there. And so, you know, we're in the hot tub one day, and... Um, my daughters, they're, they're preparing to go to college, so, you know, they, they have a, an opinion of their father, which means that they have to give him all of the right ideas about life, otherwise he'll just basically not know what to do. And so um, they, they, they came to me in the, in the hot tub uh, one time, and they said, Dad, we found this new thing, and it's just over there, the other side of the pool. I said, what is it? They said, it's a sun shower. I said, okay, so what is that? And they said, it's amazing. You go in there, and there are these lights, and there's this breeze, and you stand up, and, and it, it, I mean, it gives you a tan, but it makes you feel amazing. And I thought, well, if it's that good, I'm going to have a go. So I said to them, what do I need? They said, well, you need one pound, which is basically one dollar, a coin, a one pound coin for one minute. I said, oh, okay. So, so what, do you, what do you recommend? They said, well, you probably need three minutes to kind of get you started. You don't want to do too many. So I, 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 went, I, I went over there, and there's this, there's this white tube. It looked like something from Star Trek. I thought I was going to get transported someplace. And, and it had a kind of sliding door that kind of gave that... So it really was like a transporter room. And I, I went in, and, and there was this kind of really detailed information... And the information kind of gave me lots of stuff that I needed to do and how to stand and, and all of that. And you had to make sure you wore these goggles because, you know, they're quite important. So I, I tried the goggles on first. I couldn't see anything. So I took the goggles off and then, and then I put the coins in and it had a, little, had a little counter of time. So I put the coins in and I put the goggles on. I could hear this machine behind me and it was like... And I stood there for three minutes and I got to the end of it and I thought, I'm not sure I felt anything. The, the girls were waiting outside. They, they said, what do you think, Dad? I said, I, 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 I don't get it, really. I mean, I didn't feel the things that you said. I, I, I didn't feel the kind of the heat and the breeze. And they said, oh, Dad. They said, you need to spend more time in there. I said, well... Maybe another day. Now, of course, what a parent means by that is, I hope you forget before I have to act again. Do you remember that thing? So I just hope they'd forget. Well, next week they came and they said, Dad, you need to have another go. I said, well, I, I, I really don't want another go. And they said, yeah, but you have to. We've got the money, so off you go. So I went over there. I opened the door. I, I read the thing again. I noticed that in the, um, in the Mandarin Chinese, it was, there was a few nuances that I'd not picked up the, the last time. So I, I, I put the coins in. I got the goggles ready. I, I, I took the stance. I heard the machine. And, and I was in there for six minutes. And I was, my legs were starting to cramp a bit. I, I was feeling kind of uncomfortable. I, you know, I was doing the right position. But I got to the end of it. And I thought, this is awful. I hope the girls are not outside. They were outside. They said, what do you think? I said... Girls, that was awful. I, I've kind of got this, this cramp, and can I just go back to the hot tub? They said, oh, Dad. Well, the next week, they'd still not forgotten. They came to me again. I, I'm looking at Sally, and she said, don't look at me. You got yourself into it. You get yourself out of it. They said, look, Dad, we've been thinking about this, and we think it's probably because you're old. <laughs> you need nine minutes I said, what if it doesn't work this time? Do I, I mean, do we just keep going until I stay in there like a day? Anyway, I said, all right, well, this is the last time I'm doing it. 
So I, I went there and I got all these coins and I, I, I it was interesting. I, I read it again. There was something in the Japanese that was made that gave me a bit more of an idea. So I put the coins in. I got the, I got the goggles ready, put them on. Machine started. Now, nine minutes, I mean, just, it's a long time, isn't it? So I'm into it for a couple of minutes. I've done this twice already. And I, I realized that if I opened my eyes just a little bit, they had kind of conditioned themselves to the, to the, to the situation. And I could see. So I was looking around. There's kind of coat hook here. I, thought, I don't know what that does. What does that do? And then, then there's the door. And then there's this kind of concave mirror. Because it's a circular thing. You know, you're in a tube. Concave mirror. And it kind of made you look thin. And I thought, oh, that's kind of nice. I, I like that. And then behind me, there was this door handle. I thought, door, why is there a door handle? And I, I turned the, the door handle. And a door opened behind me. And inside there were lights. <laughs> and, and so I opened the door. And I went in. And it was amazing. <laughs> there's this heat. And there's this breeze. And I stood there. Oh my goodness. This is the best thing I've ever been in. But I'd been spending three weeks standing in the changing room. <laughs> now, maybe that means that I'm no longer qualified to speak to you this week. <laughs> but you see, that's the, kind of, that's the kind of guy I am. It takes me a lot to really understand what it is that God's saying to me. Here's the thing. I think it's very clear what it is that God's saying to us about our mission. But so often, we find ourselves not in the center of it, and therefore not experiencing the benefits and the blessings of it. We find ourselves rather in the changing room, preparing for it, but we never quite experience it. What we found, Sally and I, is that as we've read the New Testament... And we've sought to follow the Lord in the patterns that he himself established and the New Testament church lived out. That a family on mission is the best context to fulfill the Great Commission. Sally's going to come and share with us and give you a little idea of how it is that we've attempted to do this over the years. Sally, come and share with us, and I'm just going to be her lovely assistant, and I'm going to put some words up on the board. I know now you have great sympathy for me already, because I've been living <laughs> with him now for 34 years, and that story is completely and utterly true. Um, it's not a made-up one. It's not one he's read on the internet. I was there <laughs> in the hot tub every week. Um, I wanted to share with you this afternoon just the story of our family on mission. It's the one uh, that we've had the privilege of living. And um, I want to start at the beginning and then get to where we are today. Um, Mike and I met about 40 years ago. Yes, 40 years ago. Um, a very long time ago. And um, I met him when I was um, a young teenage girl. I had become a Christian through um, the Sunday school in our local church and I was at the local youth group hanging out, um, having a good time and I was um, playing table tennis, that's what we used to do in youth group, play table tennis um, with my boyfriend and I saw it was about this distance away and through the doors came a rather tall chap. Um, and he had left his bike outside and came in. And I thought, he's new. I think I'll go and say hello to him. And so I went forward and said hello and said, my name is Sally. What's yours? And he said, Mike. And I introduced him to my boyfriend, um, Nick. And over the next uh, few weeks, we got to, to know each other. We all became friends. And I said to him, as you do when you're 16, what are you going to do when you grow up? What are you going to be? Um, it was a sort of fairly standard question. And he said, I'm going to be a missionary. And in my head went, alarm, alarm, don't ever date this guy. 
He's way too serious. He'll drag you around the world. You'll have to wear weird clothing, and it would be terrible. So don't ever date him. Um, <laughs> somewhere in the intervening years, um, a couple of years later, I had forgotten that early warning system, and I did date him. Not only did I date him, but I married him. Um, and um, Mike and I were very both committed to mission, um, but we had come from very, very different backgrounds. I came from um, a hippie background. I am natural. This is my formal wear. This is me being <laughs> formal. Mike's idea of formal is a bow tie. So you can see we come from very, very different backgrounds. Um, and so we were talking about our family and what we were going to do and how we were going to do this. And in that, Mike was at seminary. And um, we had the privilege of going to see lots of other churches and pastors and wives. And one thing that I noticed about each of them um, in that time and in that place was that frequently the wives were very, very um, fed up disappointed and bitter, and the children were frequently um, rebellious. And that was the experience that Mike and I had in, in London at that time. And I said to Mike, this is awful. This, if this is going to be our life, I'm going to persuade you to be a teacher or something else. This is awful. This is um, simply uh, family or mission. You can't have both, it seems to me. You can either have a great family or you can have a great mission. And I said, let's have a great family. I'll persuade you against the mission. Um, clearly, that wasn't very successful. And um, what we decided to do was to talk about ways that we could do this differently. If we were going to have a family, which we then embarked on and had two little girls, um, we, we needed to do it differently. We needed to think of a different way of doing this. And so we talked about um, being normal and how we could do that. And what we thought was we could do family and mission. We're very capable people. We have lots of energy. We were young, even though we had a couple of children then. And we thought we can do it both. We can do it both. We're, we, you know, we're both passionate about mission and we're both passionate about family. We can do this. And so we tried. We tried very hard for about um, 10 years. About 10 years. Um, and a long experiment. Yeah, a long experiment. For about 10 years, we were spinning the plates of family and mission. And during this time, we had moved to um, a very tough inner city neighborhood called Brixton. And there, all sorts of things that I had never expected came our way. One of them was in the shape of, a, of an adopted daughter who was 13 and another, a little baby. Um, we had a son at that time. So we had four children. We had a team of people with us that were, were you know, helping us in this mission that we had to this inner city community. But it was still too much. It was still impossible. And basically, we were just managing time everywhere. We were passing the baton from one of us to the other. And it all ended um, one day when I became overwhelmed by how much and how hard it was. And Mike, Mike found me face down on the kitchen floor. I was meant to be cleaning the kitchen floor. And instead, I was crying um, very undignified onto the kitchen floor. And so Mike did a very wise thing. He packed me up put me in the car and sent me to my mother. Um, a <clears throat> brave and wise man at that moment. And it was there that we talked about how we were going to do things differently. We spent um, then a couple of years in Arkansas, North Little Rock, Arkansas, and had time to talk about this over a longer period of time. And then when we moved back to Sheffield, um, we had a, a sort of a better plan of what we were going to do. We were going to do family on mission. We had, we had talked about what being a family um, to our daughter, who was then 10, was. And I said, what do you think our family is like? Describe our family uh, to another person. And she said, we're a group of people um, all together together but we're looking in the same direction. We're moving forward step by step, 
but we're all looking in the same direction. And that's what we grabbed hold of. We grabbed hold of being a family on mission together, moving as a pack, walking forward in the mission of discipleship that Jesus had given us. Thanks, Sally. That's brilliant. Are you staying up here or are you going back down there? I'm going back down. Okay, cool. Round of applause for Sally. I think that was very good. Thank you. <clears throat> now, now, here's the thing. When Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me, he's saying unequivocally, I'm the king. There's just no doubt about what he's saying. This is at the end of Matthew's gospel that's been talking about the kingdom of God. The teaching of Jesus has been the kingdom of God from the very beginning. And now at the very end, he says, all authority. Who has authority? The king. All authority has been given to me. So I'm the king. And this is my word to you. Now, at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus taught what it was like to live under the kingship of God. We sometimes, well, we usually translate the word that I've just used for kingship as kingdom. The, the word can mean either kingship or kingdom. And Jesus said this. He said, now, guys, I understand that as you follow me, you're worried about certain things. You're worried about certain things, and the certain things that you're worried about are your food and your clothing because you're not sure where it's all going to come from. And this is what Jesus says in, in Matthew 6.33. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, I reckon... Although it's often the case, as we heard on the video, that people are in real need today, in most congregations across America, the single most scarce resource is time. And so, you know, you're listening to me today saying, yeah, we absolutely believe that the mission of God is to make disciples, is to do the thing that Jesus did, is to do the thing the first disciples did. Yes, we absolutely believe that, but when do we have the time to do it? And I completely understand that. And as committed believers, probably what you try to do is to do your mission and your family. And so you manage your time because, of course, you've got your, your, your kids to look after. You've got your, your extended family. Of course, the family in the New Testament was not the nuclear family that, that we often describe it to be. It was a much larger reality, an extended family, maybe 20 or more people. Not just blood relationships, but blood and non-blood relationships. And, and the, for the people who've been on the weekend, you'll understand what we mean by that. But, but whichever way you understand the family... You know that to fulfill the mission is going to take time, and so it's all about management. But you see, our experience is this. If you try to manage the time, you'll always operate from a position that there's too little time. Scarcity will capture your minds. The impossibility of doing the things that Jesus has asked us to do will constantly surface in your thoughts and in your conversations. What I believe Jesus wants us to understand is this, that if we seek first his kingship, all the things that we are concerned about will be taken care of. Jesus said this, he said, your heavenly Father knows what you need, and He will commit Himself to taking care of those things. Our children still live in the community near us. They've all gone to college, they've got jobs, and they've found their way back to us. It's not like they've grown up hating the fact that we're committed to the mission of Jesus. They're absolutely in love with the mission of Jesus in the same way that they're in love with Jesus himself. And the reason that that's true, simply put, is this. As a family, we have gathered around the single principle that Jesus is king 
And his last words are our first responsibility. His last words are our first responsibility. And so, as a family, we looked in that direction, and what we began to find was that that direction became the organizing principle of our life. The organizing principle of our life. Our mealtimes often became open so that people joined our family and around our table became discipled. All of our kids' friends came to Christ because as a family, we were on mission. And as we did things as a family, the friends of the family became members of the family because they became believers in Jesus. Our kids found that they weren't robbed of joy and friends and fellowship, quite the opposite. It was the most fun to be with the Breens, and so they had to beat people off with sticks to stop them trying to join us for the things that we did. Because it's fun being on mission. It's fun being a family on mission. The kids used to come to work. If it was really busy some days, Sally would pack up a packed dinner, and we'd have dinner at work. Because it was part of our mission. If the kids were doing something at school and that was the thing that they had to do, then we'd all turn up. But it was our opportunity for mission, not the thing that got in the way of our mission. And so we're talking to parents. I mean, Sally had this thing where she was basically evangelizing women who were called Helen. We never understood what that was about. But all of these women who were called Helen came to Christ through her. And it was because of the activities as a family on mission gave us the focus and the organizing principle. It was as though that single reality anchored us as a family and gave us the opportunity to go forward. My encouragement to you this night is to consider this. Jesus, your king, has made it clear what he wants you, his disciple, to do. He wants you to make disciples. And he's placed most of us in families. And if he hasn't, then my encouragement is use the the community networks here to join a family. He's placed us in families and as such has given us the place where that mission can be fulfilled most effectively. My prayer for you is that you do that and that you find great joy as you follow the Lord in his call. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord, thank you that you have given us a mission. And thank you, Lord, that you've placed us in families. Lord, we pray that our family and our idea of family would be such that we can involve and include people that are not blood relationships, but we would create wide and extended families. And Lord, we pray that our families of whatever scale or size would be families on mission, fulfilling, Lord, your last call to us. And we pray, Lord, that as we fulfill that mission, Lord, we would honor you with our lives and see the joy that fulfilling that mission can bring. And we pray this in the strong name of Jesus and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Let's thank Mike and Sally Breen, shall we? Bless you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.